Hi, my name is Connor Wright, and this is my video presentation on MP3 encoding and decoding. What I hope to cover today is a little background information on MP3s, how it works, a few block diagrams, some algorithms, and the embedded systems aspect, and where I think the industry is going. MP3 is one of the most popular digital audio encoding formats, and it's been around since 1993. Teams of engineers came from a number of companies to form the Moving Picture Experts Group, or MPEG. MP3 is an acronym for MPEG-1 or MPEG-2, Audio Layer 3, and shouldn't be confused with MPEG-3, which was eventually merged into the MPEG-2 format. MP3 uses a lossy compression algorithm to reduce the size of the file while maintaining most of the sound quality. It is said to reduce the size of a CD by up to a factor of 11, that is, 11 times smaller, and it uses a number of different techniques to achieve this. The goal of the encoding and decoding the MP3 is to allow the file to be compressed and put it onto an MP3 player iPod or to be transferred from one computer to another. Decoding gives us the option to decompress and rebuild the track similar to what it was like before it was encoded. There are no precise specifications as to how the MP3s can be encoded or decoded. This means that the coder you use will use different values and algorithms compared to other encoders. Before I begin, I would like to go over a few terms to make it easier for you to understand how the coding process works. A bit stream is a sequence of bits. That is what's outputted at the end of the encoding. When the decoding is initiated, it does not have to start out at the beginning of the bit stream. It can essentially start anywhere, but that depends on the algorithm used. The bit rate is the number of bits that are processed per unit time. In music, the bit rate is measured with kilobits per second and can easily be calculated by getting the size in bytes, dividing by the length of the recording and multiplying by 8. CBR is an acronym for common bit rate, and this is the average bit rate across the track. VBR is an acronym for variable bit rate, where the bit rate varies according to the complexity of the track. For example, the bit rate could be lowered if one instrument was playing and then increased for multiple instruments. This would further reduce the size of the track post encoding. Lossy data audio compression. This means that some loss of information is acceptable. Less important information can be rounded off or dropped completely in space. The song can be coded with decreased accuracy using a variable bitrate. Blank spots where no music is played can also be removed. Loss simply means that it won't exactly be the same as the original. Psychoacoustics, or perceptual audio coding, contributes to a huge amount to lossy audio compression. Psychoacoustics is the study of what you can hear and what you can't. High and low frequencies can be removed from the encoding along with sounds that occur at the same time as louder sounds. We're starting to come to the main part now, as to how the whole thing comes together. Well, I'll start here with the filter bank. The filter bank works sim similarly to the human ear. It is built by cascading two different types of filter bank. The input is analysed and then decompressed into subsampled spectral components. The input signal is changed from the time domain to the frequency domain. This increases the potential for redundancy removal, leading to better efficiency for the tonal removal. The filter bank also monitors the masking threshold. When MDCT is applied, the inaudible, high and low frequencies are removed. The filter bank can also be also remove pre-echoes sound which can be heard too early by increasing the amplitude of the gain preceding the attack. The perceptual model is kind of running at the same time as the analysis filter bank and you can see in the block diagram there that they both go into the quantization and coding. The perceptual model determines the quality of the encoder. It outputs the masking threshold for the MDCT using either the time domain input signal or the output signal from the analysis filter bank. The perceptual model takes into account the rules of psychoacoustics. The human ear cannot distinguish between two sounds that occur simultaneously and is most sensitive between 2 and 4 kHz. Temporal masking is another technique that is commonly used. If we hear a loud sound and it suddenly stops, it takes us a while until we can hear a softer tone. All this information is fed into the next step, and quantized and coded. Step 3 is where the algorithms are applied. It is usually done in a system of two nested loops with Hoffman encoding and MDCT. More of this will be discussed later on. At the encoding of a bitstream, a bitstream formatter assembles the bitstream so it can be played on an MP3 player or a media player or on the computer, so using iTunes, Windows Media Player or VLC, 
or any other MP3 enabled device, the sample is also checked for errors. Here is the main encoding block diagram for MP3 encoding and decoding. It's fairly similar on the decoding aspect, which I will discuss in the next slide. First you can see the input, which comes in here, and then it goes into the analysis filter bank. And then that goes into the MDCT, which I will discuss in the algorithms aspect of this. And at the same time, it's coming into the fast Fourier transform, which allows for the perceptual model to get the masking thresholds. As in, you've got a time domain coming in here, and then it gets changed over to the frequency domain, and that can be read then. So they've got look at a kind of like a bar chart of loads and loads of frequencies, and the masking threshold can be determined from that. And then everything goes into a scalar and quantizer, which uh, then goes into the Hoffman encoder, which will also be explained in the algorithms. And then that goes into a multiplexer. And then you can see it also goes into the coding of side information and back into the scale and quantizer. So it's kind of like a loop there. And then everything then goes, you know, gets all put together in the multiplexer, which is, you know, step forward the encoding of bitstream and it all goes into the digital channel. In this diagram, you can see the decoding of the block diagram. You've got the digital channel coming in and it goes into a demultiplexer and goes at the same time into Hoffman coding and the decoding of the side information. The side information is kind of like the name of the track, how they keep track of all the, the bits that are going in and out, that kind of thing. And then it all goes into a, a descaler and, and uh, then into an inverse MDCT. And then into a synthesis, which means put back together and then into the output. Here I'm going to look at some of the algorithms that you may have seen in the previous block diagram. If you haven't, you can go back and have a look at it. But the first one we come to is Hoffman encoding. In Hoffman encoding, the frequencies which occur more often are given higher priority than those which occur less often. A smaller bit size is given to these smaller values. And this in turn saves space on the encoded bit stream. Pairs of quadruples of frequencies are coded at a time, and it helps to to keep the quantization noise below the masking threshold. Analysis by synthesis with the nested loops determines the gain, which is uh, the quantization step size. Scale factors determines the noise shaping factors for each pair or quadruple, the bit rate, and the perceptual output. The MDC is also known as the modified discrete cosine transform. The MDCT is a modified Fourier transform and is used on blocks of information that are overlapped. Because the MP3 is, is lossy, the inverse MDCT is working on different data to the MDCT in the encoder. The filter bank does not achieve a perfect reconstruction of the audio, so the MDCT is applied. The fast Fourier transform uh, that, this is essentially where a masking threshold is derived from, from the input signal. The FFT also allows perceptual model to work in the frequency domain. 1024 frequencies are passed into the perceptual model. And everything is coded in C. And if you're doing some of the embedded stuff, it's kind of it's a coded in assembly. This is the embedded systems aspect of the encoding and decoding. First thing you can see is it's a 300 to a 500 megahertz CPU is needed, which is quite powerful really. It's the same with video encoding. A lot of this kind of stuff, it, it does need a powerful CPU to get through all the algorithms. Uh, well, now it used to be mostly it was done on the, the integrated circuit, but it's been changed over to processors these days, the system on a chip, and uh, modern encoders use ARM processors. Uh, if you're recording. An example of that is if you, you built a device to record a song and you wanted to go from the microphone into it, so you need an analog to digital converter. Uh, but most people, they don't really use embedded systems. They um, you know, code it on a computer and then you'll transfer it through input-output to um, whatever embedded device that you're using. I decided to put a little bit at the end here on where I think MP3 encoding and decoding is going. 
There's the MP3 Advanced Audio Encoding, which is currently used by Apple, and you find it on the iPhone and the iPod, and your know, iPod Touch and stuff like that. Um, it's fairly similar to how the MP3 is encoded and decoded. However, it does not have any backwards compatibility, and if you look at the block diagram of it, it's essentially the same. You've got the four steps, the filter bank, the perceptual coding, the quantization and scalars, and you have the encoding to a bitstream. But they've got a lot of small little bits that have been added in between there, and it's the same with the A-Track 3, which has been developed by Sony. Then you've got the MPEG-4, which is kind of going out of the audio compression area, because they go more for features rather than size. So you have large audio size, but they, you can have things such as reverb at the end of it. And you have sale, which is a synthetic component of the MPEG-4 audio. But people don't really know how to encode into it, so it's not very widely used. So now it's time to bring my video presentation to a conclusion. While well, audio takes it takes less processing power in general, and it should be considered to be equally as important as video processing, it's generally overlooked, but I think it's very important. I didn't realize how important it was until I started researching for this video presentation, but I thought it was very interesting overall, and I hope you've learned something from everything that I've shown today. If you have any questions, you can feel free to <laughs> ask me, or you can email me at c dot write one at nuigalway.ie